I never had the intention of going into television at all. I mean, this was, I was, uh, during the war, I was in the Air Force. And uh, when I came out of the Air Force, a whole group of us got together and said, we'll form a repertory company down on the Isle of Wight, strange enough, where I live now. And we did, we fit, uh, fit up rep. We played one night stands all the way around the island. And uh, then my agent sent me up to ATV because they were looking for an announcer to fill in while the ordinary announcers took their holidays. Because they had a fortnight's holiday each, they wanted an announcer for six weeks. And uh, I, she said, go up. I said, what announcer? What, what, what was an announcer to? And she said, oh, it's dead easy. You just sit there and you just talk to a camera, that's all. And uh, you fill in the bits that need filling in. Because in those days, everything's live. So there were gaps in production whereby you had to fill it in. <laughs> I went up there and I auditioned for it. And uh, the one thing that struck me, I looked at the TV Times, and the name Val Parnell seemed to crop up quite a bit. So I thought, Val Parnell obviously has got a great deal of influence here. So when I spoke directly to a camera, and I'll, I'll use this one if I might, to speak directly to a camera, I sat there with my TV Times, and I said, well, tonight, of course, you can see Val Parnell's Saturday show. And uh, then tomorrow, of course, we've got Val Parnell's Sunday night at the one that played him. Every program I spoke of with Val Parnell's name in it, I hit Val Parnell. And uh, after they'd done all the auditions, I suppose there might have been about 20 people there for the auditions. And uh, they went and saw Val Parnell, you see, and said, well, what do you think? Because he'd been watching it on a monitor. And he said, well, I, I, I thought that chap with glasses seemed to, uh, seemed to have, have it, <laughs> you know, seemed to have the right idea. So, uh, and this was it. They said, well, offered me the job. I tried to break the, the mold of just being an announcer and doing other things. And I found out, the, he, I, went, I went to ATV and I said, I'm not earning enough money. Um, you know, I've, I've got a wife, a child, I'm, I really do. I, I've, I've got to bump my salary up somewhere. Is there anything else I can do? And they suddenly said, well, yeah. They gave me a quiz show and things like that. So I started doing quiz shows. And I used to come up especially to Birmingham for those. Usually on a Tuesday they went out at 7 o'clock. I think the very first one I did, I'm trying to think back now which is the first one. I think it was Tell the Truth. I tell you the reason I remember that is because um, the, the wife of the, uh, the, the Duke of Woburn Abbey, the Duke of Bedford, uh, before she became the wife of the Duke of Bedford was on it. Her name was Nicole Millinaire and she was a French um, film producer. And it was, you know, will the real Nicole Millionaire please, uh, please stand up? And I don't know if that's how she met the Duke of Bedford, but um, I take responsibility entirely for the fact that the two got together and she became the, became the Duchess of Bedford. Which was, but that, yeah, that was one. And then um, the other one I always remember was Dotto. Turns dots into pictures and pictures into pounds. Oh, and the other lovely quiz, which I adored, was pencil and paper. That was a smashing quiz. That was so simple. It was the perfect family viewing. It was simply a lovely lady called Gwyneth Ty and myself sitting side by side on a settee. And um, we asked 20 general knowledge questions before the commercial break. And then in the second half, we asked 10 IQ questions. And the, the, the magic of it was that mum, dad, and a couple of kids watching the program, mum and dad skated home through the general knowledge questions. So it was all, you know, they were all right. But when it, came to, when it came to the second half and the IQ questions, the kids just knocked, knocked parents right off the block. And so you had this lovely thing whereby all right, so your kids beat you, but after all, they are my kids. You know, I mean, this, this was the psychology. Nobody thought this out. I mean, it was just looking for a simple program, that was all. Commercial television had, had a slight problem with Royal Command performances. The, um, you are not allowed to show religion or royalty with a minute and a half of a commercial break. These were the rules in those days by the IBA. So therefore, when the BBC did a Royal Command performance, no problem. The Queen could roll up, in she would go, performance could start, no problem at all. But when ITV did it, you had to have a minute and a half before the Queen could arrive. And the show couldn't go on until the Queen was there. So Steve said, I know, get Shaw. So Shaw, got a job for you. <laughs>
<laughs> so I would stand there, all done up in my dicky bow, etc., etc., and say, well, here we are, the credits would roll, here we are at Drury Lane Theatre, ready for the Royal Command performance. We're just waiting for the Queen to arrive now. I've had word that the Royal Car has left the palace, so we shouldn't be more than a minute or two. Meanwhile, just look around this beautiful... <laughs> And I would then do the history of Drury, Drury Lane, etc. And then suddenly, ah, Her Royal Highness is just, or Her Majesty, I beg her pardon. Her Majesty has just arrived. And out oh, the Queen would come and England would come again. My mother had a firm conviction the Queen wouldn't go without me. And it's, it's, of course, you know, <laughs> all the neighbours in Hackney, no, 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 she, she only, I mean, she always has to have Shaw there first. As long as Shaw's doing it, then, then she'd agree to go. But otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> when Police 5 started up here, um, Lou put a thing on it saying that uh, he wouldn't put a copyright on it at all. Anybody who wanted to use the idea, fine. So all the various regions started their own. Um, down in South, Southern started their own, and Anglia started their own, Granada started their own program. Then, of course, the funny thing was it was copied all over the world. The Americans read about it in um, their magazine in, Bro in Variety and sent a team of detectives over to see it. And they came and saw Police 5, and they said, oh, that's a good idea, we'll start this. And they started, called it Crime Busters. Then they started another one called Crime Stoppers, which I recopied. And um, it spread all the way around the world. And the Germans came over and they said, yeah, no, that's a good idea. But fünf Minuten? <laughs> oh, 50 Minuten, yeah. And they started a program called Dossier XY with Edward Zimmermann and uh, Peter Chafer, BBC producer, was on holiday in Germany and uh, he saw Dossier XY, came back, crime watch, uh -huh. doing Police 5, I promise you. You go out on those streets filming and <laughs> you, get, you get some lovely things, you really do. I mean, I, was, I, I forgot where it was now, but it was, um, it was a break-in to a shoe shop and uh, I was standing there, they've got a, ca a camera facing me, just like this, and, you know, just on the, on the, and they're saying, you ready, sure? I said, yeah, right, okay. Now, what happened was so and so and so, I said, this woman came up and she said, young man, she, young man, she said, I'll tell how long ago it was. She said, young man, she said, I'd like to congratulate you. I said, oh, that's very kind of you, thank you very much. She said, what a nice shop you have here. <laughs> she, she said, whenever, I, whenever my daughter comes over to see me, we always come round, and I, I said, well, well, I'm very pleased for you, dear. Yes, very pleased. Oh, yes, she said. Keep up the good work. I said, yes, 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 I will. She ignored everything. Ignored the camera, ignored everything. Um, I was asked to do a program for the kids, Junior Police Five. And I was a bit dodgy about this. I thought, I don't know, you know, asking kids what, what happens if they grass on their dad or something like that. You know, this really had a touch of the Hitler Youth about it. I thought, no, no, no. And then I thought round it and I thought, oh, well, I know what. I would tell them. You are observers. You don't do anything. Because the, my worry was that some kid would go up to a guy fiddling with a car and say, you know, I am what Junior Police 5 and I'm arresting you or something like that. And boom, the kid would get a wallop. And so I said, no, don't forget, you don't, you don't do anything. You always have a word with mum and dad first. If you th see something that you think you ought to report to the police, have a word with mum and dad. That gives dad a chance to say, you keep your trap shut. And, <laughs> And uh, then they will do the contacting the police. You don't do anything. You're an observer. All you do is keep them peeled. And uh, somebody I was working with at the time said, why don't you use it on the, on the main show? And I thought, oh, people aren't going to believe me. What, how can you do it on Police 5, keep them peeled? Anyway, I tried it out and it, it clicked. And in fact, if I didn't do it, people would come and say, why didn't you say keep them peeled? I mean, they almost got addicted to the old, uh, <laughs> keep them peeled.